I am so sorry I'm late. No, it's okay. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's see. Let's roll this up here. Hey, this is the backdrop from uh, the from my show, Maddie, that I did in New York. So, okay. Uh, that's my that's my fun little virtual background. How the heck are you? I'm really, really sorry. It's been, it's been so hard to to coordinate it because go figure out of the blue stuff has been really busy recently. Oh, that's no problem. So I could just uh, start from the beginning and kind of jump around before uh, getting into anime questions. <laughs> sure, it's all it's all good. Bring it on now. You know, I it, it's it's been so long. I hardly remember anything. But, uh, <laughs> I'll try and answer them as best I can. It's really, it's been a very lucky life. That's mm -hmm. all I gotta say. So, is it accurate that you weren't trying to pursue acting at first? No, I was pursuing acting. I wasn't pursuing voiceover stuff. Okay. Um, so that was really kind of a fluke and 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 just one of those falls in your lap lucky thing. I was doing uh, a horrible play. Um, it actually. Uh, it was the script that was horrible. We were all fine, but it was just a really bad play. It was an adaptation of Anna Karenina. And the thing that was so amazing about that is there were seven of us that were involved that became like lifelong family. I mean, to this day, and that's decades ago, we still call ourselves the family. We went to Olin Mills and had a family portrait taken. We just had a reunion uh, a little while ago, but one of those family members was Laura Cody, who I'm sure that you know her name from anime. Yeah. Um, and we used to go after the show to the Denny's nearby this theater in Hollywood. And one night she, she said, hey, you want to come see what I do? And it's like, uh, sure. Well, what? She said, well, I have a 2 a.m. session. What? Well, it's a low-budget anime. I didn't even know what that was. Japanese cartoon that I'm dubbing into English. And uh, they can't afford the daytime hours, so the studios run 24-7. So I have a 2 a.m. session. You want to come see what I do? It's like, sure. So I went down in the basement of this, uh, the, this studio called Intersound. And I just sat in the corner of, of that while she was doing it. And at the end of the morning, it's about 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, the fellow who was directing it, Ed Menix, wonderful guy, passed away a number of years ago, just with one of these voices. He, he, uh, he, he said, hey, you do this, don't you? And I can still remember exactly. Went, yeah, of course I do. And he said, well, what are you doing at nine o'clock? I went, sleeping? He goes, no, 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 I got an Italian movie. I'm dubbing into English. Uh, my actor bailed on me last night. I'm eating the studio time. You'd be right for it. Uh, go have breakfast at the Denny's because he heard all our stories. Uh, I'll meet you down there at nine o'clock. It'll take us about six hours. Well, I just happened to be good at it and we got done in 45 minutes. So, you know, which was bad for me because at the time there were, it, it was, you know, just an hourly wage, which was great. I think it was $15. And it's like, oh my gosh. But you got to remember this is decades ago. So that was yeah. incredible. Minimum wage was like three fifty. dollars so, um, but we didn't have um, the contracts that we eventually worked out with foreign dubbing and all that stuff. So there was no two hour minimum. Uh, and so I got paid 15 bucks to, to save, save him. But he hired me the next week, the week after that, Bob Barron called and said, hey, I got a project that Medic said you'd be right for. Next thing you know, I'm doing Robotech and mm -hmm. that kind of kicked it off. And I haven't stopped working since really. Um, and all of that morphed into doing stuff for movies and TV. And I've just been really, really lucky and, and um, super lucky that I consider Laura still to this day, one of my best all time friends. So mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah. Well, even prior to that, I was going to ask how you got into SAG. Uh, that was fun. Um, so I was a baseball player. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I played ball. I always consider myself an actor, but um, I came out from Nashville to play ball at UCLA and there's a there's a huge difference between being awesome in Tennessee and just being pretty good in California. Um, so it appeared clear that I was never going to make the major leagues. And uh, so when I started doing the acting stuff after school and I was coaching at Santa Monica High, so I was still staying in the baseball thing, I started getting sent out on all of these baseball commercial auditions and uh, the first gig I got was a Budweiser commercial, um, where it was just kind of silly. I, I even, I, you know, I, I don't know why in the audition I pretended I was left-handed 
and and it was like wiggling my butt and being really silly and it, the the whole premise was the guy keeps calling time out because he doesn't want to he doesn't want to play so tying the shoes doing the eyes and you can still hear in the commercial i have a tape of it somewhere come on eddie was the guy catching and it's kind of fun so that's how i got my sag card okay from budweiser and uh so with the first really major anime role being kyle and robotech uh, did you did you take to dubbing easy or was it difficult at first for me it was easy now you, you have to remember this was um pre it really was a skill basically you know they were still cutting sound like yeah with actual razor blades um and that ended relatively quickly because then they started using uh videotape like even vhs tapes and stuff i mean i'm not sure what the engineering stuff was at intersound but um it was dubbing and we had uh we had just the script with a time code on it and the line and we would we would look at it but you had to nail it on the time code now it, you know they they have beeps i'm sure you've heard of so it goes beep 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 and on the imaginary fourth beep it's been queued up to lock into record right on the first you know hey how you doing yeah. you know um but us it was like hey how you doing and and so it was really a skill to just nail it from the picture and then um you know, for whatever reason, in my head, you know, this, this is, this is my thing. I just kind of always got the, the, the mouth closes on M's, B's and P's. So look at the script, try to find the M's, B's and P's, what the line is. And then as you're watching it, you know, the, the writers got pretty good, pretty good, uh, you know, and, and still some of those fellows like Steve Kramer and, uh, and the like are, are still very good at writing sync. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, sometimes you could just you could morph the line or it just didn't work because the translation was goofy and just try to hit those M's, B's and P's. That's kind of what happened on that first job when I was dubbing that Italian movie into English where he said it was going to take four, uh, six hours and he had every little line cued. It was basically a scene where this kid was was having a PCP insanity breakdown. Right. And screaming at his mother and all this stuff. And. I sort of, it's like, it's like two pages of just like nonstop. I can't do it. I can't live anymore. I can't do it. You know, all this stuff. But he kept, I, I noticed he kept, you know, the cameras going around him. So it would go to the back of his head. And so all I did to, to get it done in 45 minutes and it kind of, he, Ed Mannix thought it was brilliant. It was basically every time his face was on the camera, I just went, <laughs> and on the back of his head, I can't do it anymore. My mom, I can't, blah, blah, blah. And, and it worked. Yeah. So literally it, it took no time at all, but you know, that was the thing where all I had to do was hit the closed mouths on the, <laughs> and, and there you go. Mm -hmm. Sorry for being loud. No. <laughs> so it just kind of cut my tooth. Just, you know, it, it really wasn't a thing that I was looking to do, but man, it was fun. And it's also too, like uh, you guys, fans and historians of this stuff. Um, it was a time where um, you just, you would walk in and another actor would be walking out and you go, Hey, who was that? You know, it's like, oh, that was Kerrigan Mayhan. So, oh, okay. Well, eventually you become awesome friends. Kerrigan actually direct, directed my my show, this backdrop. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so if anyone's interested in him, he's living up in Morro Bay, and he's awesome as always. And I named one of my kids after him. And uh, matty.org is all about the show, and you can find out some more about Kerrigan. Um, but uh, where was I going? Oh, so there, there – you, you would see people all the time and eventually some of these people became famous and you go, Oh, I know, yeah, I know the guy from Intersound or you know, whatever. But there was a core of us that, that always then eventually once they needed Walla stuff, crowd scene stuff in all this, then we finally would work together. It's like, Hey, you're the, Oh, you played my dad. Oh, you're my mom. Oh, okay. Now I know who you are. And it, you know, and then it became a real stable of voiceover actors at Intersound. And of course, everybody branched out in many different ways. And um, and eventually I got so busy, you know, with Laura and others doing movies and TV stuff that people stopped calling for the anime stuff just because I wasn't available. Um, yeah. 
but it's, uh, I, I mean, I just got asked recently in an email, would you be interested in doing anime again? It's like, well, sure, of course I would. Yeah, I, if I'm doing nothing else, are you kidding? And now it's really weird because during the pandemic, uh, so many people have morphed and figured out how to do a lot of this from home because so many of us have good home setups and those who didn't got them during the pandemic um and the studios and whatever are able to tap directly into our microphones and it's 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 like we're there i miss people in person and there have been some times when we've been able to work together um but then other times where we'll go down to a studio and they stick us all in separate rooms so even though we're there together we're not actually together we're just in the same building um so it's been remarkable how they've been able to uh, still do things at this time. I mean, of course, it's going to get easier and easier, but I think for the studios themselves right now, I mean, they're thinking that we may not go in in person, you know, unless it's just one of us um, for a couple of years because, you know, like uh, let's say it's Warner Brothers. They want to keep their bubble of people doing production on a TV show or a movie, and they don't want an actor walking in who god only knows where i've been for the last three days and yeah. contaminating the 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 lot so anyway so it's it's fun it, it keeps you from riding in the traffic but i do miss my peeps even if mm -hmm. i can see them on the zoom call like i'm seeing you it, it goes in cycles with um uh, uh people like skip stelrecht i mean you know yeah. he, like all of a sudden every job i'm on they're skip with his ukulele and you know and you and you just click with certain people and you have a blast. And so then the group leaders or whoever's hiring keeps you together for the next five times they're doing something. And then all of a sudden you're working with somebody else. But yeah, Bridget is one of those folks. She, she got into the, to the ADR stuff that I've been doing forever, a little bit later, right. but has been prolific in it. And she's just one of the awesome human beings and, uh, her son and my youngest are almost the same age, uh, you know, like just one year apart. And yeah. So there's a lot of that too, where um, all of us actors sort of had kids at the same time. And so now we're like, oh my gosh, you want, you want a Grammy? Is she want a Grammy? Well, oh my gosh, you know, uh, and uh, oh, your kid, he's in Berlin. I saw that, you know, he's gaming. So that's actually, I don't know if you're a gamer, but my my son, uh, Christy, is like a big hotshot in the gaming world. He's known as Ender and he, uh, is one of the top analysts for League of Legends. Oh, uh -huh. games, and now he's doing Valorant and a few other things. And if you haven't seen it, just dropped last week, Riot Games just dropped their own first three episodes of a series. It's, it's, it's the top watched in the world right now for this last week. It's called Arcane. Okay. And, yeah. um, it's really well done. The animation, um, it's, it's in the anime tradition. So it's the character's all that funky look but it's but it's sort of 3d it's and i i'm not sure what the studio is um but i think it might be out of korea don't hold me to that um and they sort of have grown with riot they started doing um music videos and stuff for them when league of legends first came out like 10 11 years ago whatever um and so i highly recommend if you're an anime fan and you want to see something that's different but the same but really great animation arcane on on netflix it's uh it's fantastic and right. my kids involved with all that riot game stuff not like he doesn't do the dubbing but i think mm -hmm. he does too <laughs> and since you got to be the male lead and kiki did you know lisa michelson too yes gosh you know and again what a wonderful soul um and her husband greg snagoff um it it that was super, super tragic. It's really kind of funny. It, go, it kind of all goes back to Laura, too. Um, I knew Lisa through Laura before Greg did, and Laura uh, introduced them. Oh. And then it was just so sad, the accident, um, because I think they just misdiagnosed, you know, they didn't know. Do you know the story? Yeah, that? back when I interviewed Wendy Lee, she told me all of that anyway, it's, yeah it's you know and, and it's personal stuff so i probably shouldn't talk about details but um she had internal injuries i guess and they didn't know it and um if she had been diagnosed properly 
um, and she'd still be with us. But marvelous singing voice, beautiful spirit, wonderful smile, amazing person. She and Greg were such a perfect match, and um, and it's still it's it's still sad all these years later. Mm -hmm. I just heard too that uh, Mari Devon retired. Did she? Huh. According to Julie Madalena. <laughs> anyway. Well, there. Well, there you go. So yeah, there. There's a name I haven't. I haven't heard in a while. But again, it's <laughs> like uh, you. You see people, and like so. So you're not having barbecues with them every weekend, but every time you see them, it's like, hey, how you doing? Big hug and a kiss, and all that stuff. Of course, you can't give hugs and kisses anymore in, with in pandemic land. Right. Um, yeah, this a lot of fun, talented people that have been fortunate to work with, and. Um, people that are really talented in this little segment of the world that could would should be stars in in other segments of this world you know it's it's kind of you know the luck of the break and you work and you whatever and for me um I've always just been really lucky because I have always from the very beginning when, you know, you're a kid actor and people say, hey, I want to be a star. I want to do this. I want to do that. It's like, well, I want to be great at what I do and work all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, let somebody else decide that other stuff. So in that, I've been really lucky and, you know, able to support a family and raise three kids and put the one who wanted to go through college through college and uh, mm -hmm. you know and it's just it's it's been a good life but i yeah but i still feel like i'm 20 i feel like i'm you quite honestly i'm serious you yeah. know so it's like glasses are it's like what you know you forget it's like there was a time where i didn't need them you know All right um, and i think i sound the same quite honestly but you know take that min may mm. <laughs> There's another one, uh, Becky, Rebecca Forstad, <laughs> Min May, yep. uh, who's just like a delightful human being. So Tony Oliver, all these names that you know, uh, quite they're, they're all universally wonderful people. And so I couldn't have been more lucky to meet them, you know, just on the wayside um, by, by luck. So, mm. you know. I think my personal favorite anime role of yours is uh, Yakumo in Three by Three Eyes. Yakumo Fuji with the mirror. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was the, it, it's, I'm trying to think. Um, it may have been, it was the first one. If I'm thinking, if I'm thinking three by three, I mean, I know that I'm thinking that he had the yeah. eye and he covered it up and all that stuff and had special powers and all that stuff. But it, it seems to me it was the first anime that I ever saw that was really violent, like, Mm -hmm. somebody got hit by a bus and there was blood blowing all over the place and i it was like you know i mean i knew anime was kind of grown-up cartoons but i didn't know that it was you know <laughs> and then and then you know really did work on some kind of gross but very good things um so uh yeah that was that that was a that was a fun one in fact it's the, it, back in the day you know and i'm sure you hear a lot of us say that um it was a time where so many didn't want, like, I don't want my name in the credits. You know, yeah. They didn't want to be known as a voice actor. Of course, that's stupid now, um, you know, because even, even in movies and TV, it's producer's discretion. So some put your names in the credits. So, like, if you were to do an IMDb search or a Google on me, you'd see hundreds of credits, you know, for the, but it's maybe 5%. Yeah. You know, so be, because they it just doesn't get get listed in um, in all those databases. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, Robotech, I wasn't I wasn't in the 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 guild yet. And, and you know, it was like that next year. And uh, Lynn Kyle was only the first season of it. So my name is actually in the credits. Um, you know, I didn't have to. Well, I won't talk about people using pseudo names or anything like that. I never <laughs> said that. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, but then after that, it, you know, it was then working to get all these small anime people to sign on, uh, to turn their projects into union projects, even though they were super low budget and they couldn't really afford stuff. And, right. you know, and, and then, so it was quite something when, when, uh, we came up with the foreign dub agreement, which I think was 
forty dollars an hour with a two hour minimum, which at the time it's a it was a lot of money for for that thing. But I think it went you know over twenty years before it was ever amended in any way. And I think even now it's maybe. I mean, it's it's been a you know, few years since I've done it. You know, maybe probably five or six. So it's probably up to forty five, maybe. But you know, okay, a lot of see that. But in that, you know, a couple of bucks gets thrown to the pension and to insure, You know, so so at least it, it it was progress for stuff that was not being uh, thrown into the union kitty at all. So it's good for you know for those of us who were were doing a lot of work to try and get. Uh, some of the benefits from that, even though they couldn't afford big dollars. Mm. One of my signature, signature questions um, I like to ask if there's, uh, like, uh, in terms of anime, what's the single most emotionally intense role you've had to, or headspace you've had to get into? Um, you know what? There, there's several. I, for me, always the favorite will be Lynn Kyle in that. Yeah. First season the macross of of, of robotech because it was really my first you know big job starring role whatever um there uh there was a, a long series uh called el hazard right which yeah. had magnificent world you know and that was a ton of stuff and it was being trying to be finished up about the same time i was taking my show to Times square in new york at the lambs and so um, you know, I was gone for four months and then coming back and trying to finish that up for, uh, for, uh, Kevin Seymour back, back then. He's another mm. sweet guy that I miss. Um, but that was fun. It was weird. It was weird because I was like this, like totally geeky, you know, you know, what, what was his name? It was like Yakimo, but it wasn't. Makoto. Um, but anyway, that was fun just because it was a really long, uh, series, but I'd have to say, one of the most fun things ever and it wasn't um it wasn't anime but it was one season on power rangers time force yeah. where i was the voice of frax the evil robot and i don't know much about you know power rangers there's fans out the wazoo who just <laughs> adore it i look at it and go yeah whatever but this particular season was really really good and this robot had a character arc like none other and had a, a emotional breakdown at the end the last two like i think one of the, what is it the fans frax's fury is the one episode there's all this stuff is on youtube and netflix now but but he was one of these guys and um and and that was really fun for me because of the emotional arc at first we thought he was a robot <laughs> right yeah. and then he turns out being the evil sidekick to the bad guy and then it turns out he's got a, a, a mad scientist inside him who has shrunk himself that everyone thought was dead for all these years, but that's who's who the robot really is. And then they, you know, no spoilers, but they kind of blow him up and it's really, it's really bad as he dies because he's had this cathartic moment realizing that he's been a bad guy all his life. Um, and it's the only season of Power Rangers where the Rangers don't win at the end. So it's one of those mm -hmm. things. You know, I'm so that was uh, that's the answer. It's that was fun for me as a dub thing. It wasn't an anime thing. Um, what was the Fighting Spirit was fun uh, oh, because, because, well, because Richard Epcar asked me to do it, and all of my anime stuff is all this, this stuff, you know, it's all the young guy stuff, right? Um, but this was one of he was one of these, a boxer guy, and it's like I never, you know, I never got to pretend I was Richard in in you know in any of these pro projects. So it was kind of fun to have a different voice in in that. And Epcar is one of the all time greats to to work with and joke with. And hey, buddy, everyone will tell you that that's what he, he that he, you know. I don't know if it's because he forgets people's names or he just calls everybody buddy, but it's charming and wonderful. It's like, hey, buddy, hey, buddy. You know, that's just yeah. what you do when you see Richard. Um, and again, one of the great all-time human beings. So, and then with um, Ken and Street Fighter 2, did it take a while for you to realize the popularity of his character? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it literally was years like, for, you know, and I'm sure that you've heard a lot of us uh, say this, but it was just a job. You know, I was a kid like you, basically younger than you. <clears throat> and it was like, holy crap, I got work tomorrow at Intersound? Whoa, nice. 
So you go, you, you work for two hours and you, and you make 40 bucks. Oh my gosh. Holy crap. That's amazing. Um, you know, and I, at the time I was living on the beach in Santa Monica, got really lucky my sophomore year at UCLA, I was playing baseball and, uh, found out that the women's sports information director at UCLA was living on the beach. So I rode my bike down one day and knocked on the door and Lee opens the door. It's like, Fires, what are you doing here? I said, Hey, if you ever leave, can I have your place? Get out of here. See you Monday. Boom. A couple months later, get a phone call. I can't take it anymore. I'm moving to Northern California. You, you really want it because it's rent control. It's only 171 bucks a month and a $10 parking sticker to park in the pier parking lot. It's like, wow. you know, even then that was stupid, you know, stupid cheap. <clears throat> so I yeah. lived on the beach for 15 years and used to roll in to even ride a moped all the way to Hollywood uh, to, to do work and stuff. Cause that's what you did when you're, you're a kid and having fun and, you know, loving life. <laughs> but no, I didn't know what the popularity was until, um, you know, y y every once in a while you get a letter and you kind of wonder how do they find you? Um, but, uh, and now it's a lot easier with email and websites and all that kind of stuff. So that we would have known instantly if it had been this digital era, how famous it was. In fact, it, all that stuff would have instantly gone to Netflix. The world would have blown apart in the eighties as far yeah. as this stuff is rather than Robotech's the only anime that's on TV at all, you know, and it was remarkable because it was the first series, you know, afternoon for older people you know, ever. It was the first anime thing that was on the air in the United States. It, at least that's my understanding. It was a big to-do. They were talking about it at the time, you know, Bob Barron and the guys, and it's like, and I could care less about any of that. Okay, yeah, I guess. I guess it's groundbreaking. For me, it's just a gig. Yeah. You know? um, but, but then you, you now when you go to, like, I'll go to a Power Rangers convention, and it's anime fans who come and want to talk about this, this, or this. It's like, you're the soundtrack of my life. And I, I'm like, what do you, what, what is, I, mean, I don't, I don't even know what they're talking about, but I want to. So it's like, hold it, explain to me. Do you have a picture of this character? Do you remember, you know, cause I'm sure it was called something else when I did it, you know, um, uh, there were other fun things uh, working on with like Dave Mallow, uh, Dog Tanyon and the Muska Hounds. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Captain Harlock and the queen of a thousand years. I think that was with Greg Snegoff. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so there's there's titles that you remember, um, but where are they now? We um, we did an original French animation uh, called Inspector Mouse, and apparently it was only ever released in France, and so you can't find the 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 um, the dubs of it anywhere, even online. So, but there were so many of us that worked on that, like uh, Joyce Kurtz, Edie Merman um uh you know and all in the all in the same room and then they went and drew it so it was original animation not a dub and that was that was a cool fun project and i was i was toothy and toothy what, what i do so you know he, you know i very seldom get to do silly voices because yeah. i don't consider myself a voiceover guy and a voice guy but i'll um you know, I'll, I'll morph it and get to do it. So Toothy was one of these things. I just figured he's got buck tooth teeth. And then uh, what was it? Gordy was the other, the other giant mouse. He's like, kind of like an oversized rat. And so that was really fun to originate those things, but we never really got to see them um, done. So were your, cause I know that you had lead roles in a few different Gundam projects Were those early on too. Everything was mostly early on. It was uh, <clears throat> it was kind of like um, from I'm gonna guess uh, eighty three or four um, to ninety five was like the bulk of all of that stuff. Um, but again, like starting around you know, 1990, we started getting so busy doing the, the live stuff, TV and movie stuff and all that, that um, it was really hard for, um, for them to schedule me to come in and dub stuff. Cause it would be, uh, we got, I got two hours on Tuesday at, from two to four. And then on uh, Thursday from nine to 11 and, you know, I would not be available for, you know, so it was hard to schedule me. And so, um, eventually 
I started doing less and less of the anime, but it's sad for me because for me, that was always the most fun. And to the point where when you're revoicing somebody in a major motion picture and you know, now everything is, is computerized. They can move stuff a frame. They can stretch it out. You know, the, the old cutting skill and the dubbing skill just isn't there. So like, you know, uh, let's say it says, well, but I said, shoot the president. And I go, but I said, shoot the president. And it's off. And they go, perfect. Great move. I said, hold it. I can do it again. I can get it better. No, that's fine. We got it. We'll, we'll fix it. So for old school people like me, you just kind of go, really? Why not just do it again? Save you the time of, of squeezing it. But I guess it's, you know, that's, that's part of technology and, and they're good at it. So mm-hmm. um, they, they, Fix it in post has always been a joke, but now it really is true because you, you can fix almost anything with a computer. But it really drives me nuts if I'm watching a movie and I and it's a bad dub. It probably bugs you too because yeah. as a person, it's like yeah. he didn't he didn't say that, you know, and it draws your eye to it and it takes you takes me out of the thing. Most people don't recognize, you know, or you know, even notice stuff like that, but because we do it. I, you know, I'm looking here and then I hear something that's horrible and I realize that most of the planet is not looking at that guy, but it makes me nuts. Mm-hmm. Like, well, that's, that's really lame. You got to be better at your job than that. Right. Yeah. Do you do voiceover stuff at all? Just the, 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 the rock solid interview historian. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that's, you know, and, and you can quote me, get that put on a plaque, rock solid, you know, historian. I would, I would love like, going back to the not having names on credits i would love now because again i didn't care it's like you go to the job you go home there was no internet so that's gone i guess that's going to be in bulgaria somewhere you know and never even thought you know, i would love to have a real full list of everything you know that was accurate and and have it because because again like i say like even <clears throat> The, the anime sites are really great at finding stuff. And a lot of things is like, well, I, yeah, I know that was called something else. Cause I have no idea what that is. Yeah. Um, but um, like, it'll have the Japanese name. And because most, I don't know if you're like my kids, they want to, they don't want the dubbed version. They watch, they watch the subtitles for them. Mm-hmm. That's what they, their anime is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but well, and, and, and to a point, that's that's cool because, you know, a, a lot of the dubbed is, well, hey, <laughs> it's like, well, that's not realistic. Come on, man. you got a better voice than that. Um, but uh, I don't even know where I was going with that with that thought process. But um, uh, I wish that I wish that I had the, the full list because I think it would be fun. And then, oh, my gosh, if if you had a full accounting of someone like Epcar, that would be hilarious because that would be like a 2000 page volume. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of it's, it's the stuff, you know, after more of the internet. So like after 1995, a lot of people, you know, the more stuff was kind of, you know, obviously kept up with and all that stuff. So I really thank the fans uh, and like, you know, the different anime sites for finding those things for me because otherwise i would have no clue beyond like you know three by three eyes uh i did i i, I wish i knew which of the gundams that i did because it was more than one you know mobile suit gundam what um you know to find those um you know uh the el hazards uh, the robotex you know the, the I, it would just be a small list in my head of the stuff that i can remember where like i was a leading character um, yeah and it would be really fun to find a picture of every single one. So anime fans out there, if you got a picture of a character that I did, please send it with a description. That would be really kind of neat. And I'll stick it on the website and, and, and give you credit. That'd be great. Well, I know one of the like more modern roles that you had was uh, playing a little dog, Edward and Mare. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. And there's, and, and, and other things like, um, uh, gosh, what was the, it's actually a famous, uh, feature film. Uh, and I, I want to say spirit of the way, but it's, um, where I was, uh, the guy, he has glasses. I can still see his, his the character's face. Oh yeah. Kiki's delivery service. Yeah. yeah Kiki's delivery service, you know, um, 
that kind of stuff, which was really, really fun. But once upon a time, see now everyone goes and sees stuff in its original language. So foreign films are actually seen as foreign films. And I think Il Postino started that because he won best actor for ah, Principessa. Um, but before that, we dubbed all of those major Oscar nominees. So I can remember, I, you know, I, I was in the room with Louis Malle doing Au Voix Les Enfants, you know, Goodbye Children. Um, and Candace Bergman, Bergen was there and, I, and, and she hadn't done, um, uh, what was her TV show, the, the reporter? Uh, anyway, she hadn't done that yet, but I knew her as, you know, her dad's the big famous ventriloquist, uh, you know, and, oh, they're married. I didn't even know that. Um, uh, and, uh, Nicholas and Alexander doing Alexandra, uh, doing, doing that one. And remembering that those were released in movie theaters, the dubbed versions. And now you can't, e you know, they don't even do the dubbed versions on the, on the DVDs, although no one buys DVDs anymore either. So, um, for a while, I thought that that was the greatest thing about DVDs and Blu-rays is they could put every single dubbed version on that one thing if anybody had a desire to watch it that was kind of oh that's a great use of the technology right yeah. um, but i think they mostly just turned it into different variations of subtitles rather than the dubbed versions mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah i don't think i don't think so none of the major foreign films get dubbed anymore i don't think there's a lot of stuff that's shot like there, there was a period of time uh, during the '90s <clears throat> where uh, they were shooting a lot of stuff. I want to say Bulgaria, but it's over in Croatia, wherever, somewhere in in Eastern Europe. And um, they would get famous movie stars from all of these countries, none of which spoke English. And then it would be someone like Peter York, you know, the British, you know, uh, would be the 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 draw that would get people on you know that would be on the poster it's a peter york film and then they would have us go in they would teach these actors phonetic english so the acting was very bad you know the the speech patterns so you're having to go the acting was very bad and try to make it sound like they're talking normally but there were a lot of those that happened back to back because i guess they were cheap and they were geared for going all over the the world not america to make tons of money to create content for people and in each of the countries that it would go to they one of their stars would be in these projects so it was an easy sell and they did them cheap and you know a lot of bad dracula type movies and mm -hmm. all that. but you know the, you see you've got me thinking about stuff that i've done that i haven't thought about in forever but that but that stuff is but that's fun you know but a dubber's life is kind of lonely because it's pretty much just you and whoever's running the session, you know, working. So you're not with the other people where it gets fun is when you have a Walla session where they just need, you know, four or five people to create 75 in a mob scene or whatever. And, you know, and then you're all in the room together and laughing and having a good time. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask too, with all the, with all the ADR you've done for more, like recent major films and shows have you gotten to meet like the actors in, in sometimes yeah <clears throat> well it depends um you know uh it depends what their their involvement in the project is so sometimes you'll meet actors that it's like hey guys we have a principal coming in you know clear the room and so you'll walk out of the room and oh here comes reese witherspoon um or what have you or like I worked on that thing you do, which was the first thing that Tom Hanks wrote and directed. And he was there all day and was absolutely delightful and a ton of fun. Um, David Duchovny uh, wanted to play basketball with us all during lunch. You know, oh. a great guy. Um, uh, George Clooney is, uh, again, it, it's like you're not you're not buddy buddy with these people. You're just in the same room with them. And. It's just nice when the people that you assume to be what they actually are, they actually are. It's, right. <laughs> it's kind of great. So like, yeah, George Clooney is the guy who walks in a room with a cutoff uh, blue jean shorts and a T-shirt and seems like everybody's friend from high school, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so without so, not, you know, not dropping names and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it really is fun to work with people. It's the most fun 
when what little interaction you have with them turns out to be, you know, hey, I'm an actor too. Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I can, but I can remember working on uh, The Great Debaters, uh, which Denzel Washington, I think, directed. So, um, uh, so we're at Sony, and there's a horrible lynching scene in this in this movie. And I get I get hired to do all that kind of stuff because I grew up in Nashville, right? So it's real easy for me to be gross and horrible and and just a, a hateful human being, you know, doing all that thing, you know, like yeah, yeah, my bear, you know, all that stuff, right? And um, did a take of this thing. It's just it's a horrible scene, and you know, uh, you know, they end up hanging a guy from a tree and lighting him on fire and it's just it's just awful and mm -hmm. you know and i grew up in integrated schools so um any of that kind of despicable language was always with my buddies you know and they're you know and and they're using the words not me you know you know hey but what's going on you know it's, uh, you know that was just part of my life growing up so it's always been ugh, like this even before it was like politically correct to you know say things like call it the n-word and what have you and uh so denzel had been in in the back behind the glass with howard london who was the recording engineer uh over at sony everyone knows howard and he cracks the door open and he, he points me he goes and he's got this look on his face like what did i do and so i go over and he's just at the crack of the door he goes he goes you you can you can do the real deal and i go oh cool thanks he goes what's wrong I go, what is it? what's wrong with you i said what do you mean he says do you think that you can offend me and i'm like going uh, and he says i need you to try to offend me but i guarantee you you can't you can't offend me try and he closes the door and then what came out of my head and the next thing, you know, it was something horrible, like, you know, it smells like chicken. I don't, I don't know what it was, but it was just awful. And then he cracked the door and he put his, and he, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, it's like, that's not someone you're in the room with and going, Hey, 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 but it's like, Oh, he needed something, knew how to get it across, you know? And it's like, I'm not a star. It's like, I, I can hear you are authentic. I, I need you to be horrible right here. This is important right here that you're horrible. I'm like, okay. But it still, it makes my skin crawl even thinking about it. I, I never watched it. So I don't even know what the final version was because it's just like, it's to me, that kind of stuff. You can't, you can't shower that stuff off. Right. So to me, it's really kind of bizarre that it seems like so many people are gross like that and mm -hmm. really do see differences in human beings i don't i just never had i don't know it whether it's because i was uh you know in athletics forever and it's like you know these are teammates these people help you win and it's like people are either good people or the bad people i don't i don't care what book they read or what they worship or what their skin color is or their accent and so I, you know we're getting into this philosophical thing and it's an anime interview but i you know just for people i i i, I just i just don't get it you know, yeah. it's, there, there really is in my brain. I just, I don't see it. I go, man, she's beautiful. I could care less, you know, mm -hmm. what anything else is like, my gosh, she's gorgeous. Anyway. So there you go. That's, that's my philosophy for the day. Go ahead and lock that up and, and let's move on. <laughs> all that, all that came from, you know, Hey, is anybody nice? Yeah. Well, it's okay. <laughs> there were, there were some ADR things I wanted to ask if there were any specific story. I know you got to be, so that you got to be in, uh, do ADR for choke. Right. There's so, so there, again, there's so many, uh, projects. Um, <clears throat> so people, it's like, well, what did you do in frozen? And it's like, I, you know, I, I would have to watch it with you and go, Oh, that's me, you know, okay. but it's more like, you know, tells me get her, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, and it doesn't sound like it's like, so, uh, like for the, the more famous animation things, I mean, I could say, um, you know, cause there, cause there's more than just this, but it's really hard to say, Hey, at this point in the movie, you can find that's me. Um, yeah. in Incredibles two, for example, though, at the very beginning, Elastigirl's, you know, doing kind of her spider, Spider-Man 
thing going all through the the town you know and chasing it and there's a helicopter and she attaches to a helicopter climbs up into the door and then there's this giant the pilot turns around and goes elastigirl what are you doing here and that's me okay that's cool you know but um but yeah there's and then there's other things where you end up Ah, gosh, it's 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 so funny because they're they're not your, your most memorable things, but it's kind of a funny story. So doing Eddie Murphy's version of Doctor Doolittle, and Lee French was the coordinator for that, and they needed you know a a skunk gets stepped on, and so they wanted ah, nah, you know whatever that would be for the skunk, you know, um, and so it just happened to be me, and I and and I don't know, I did just like really bad Peter Laurie and go. Oh, you, you stepped on my snooter shooter or whatever. The, it was a line, something like that. Yeah. And they laughed and they howled. And I think they put me in the credits as the skunk. Oh, yeah. Be, because they laughed so hard. I mean, I, yeah, I, you know, so there's fun things like that. But as far as all the projects I ever worked on, the only one where, see, because me, you know, and I think a lot of your dubbers and whatever, you know, people talk about oh talent and da, da 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 i i think more of it in terms of i'm lucky i mean almost anybody could do some of the stuff that i do uh so it became important for me to be known as the sports guy in hollywood um because then people would hire me so every i mean even even this week hey we got a football game eddie can you do that for me so I'm like well sure patterson back to throw across the middle caught by closer 36 37 yard line Brought down there by Big John Fowler, pick up a seven on the play. It'll be second down and three to go from the 37, you know, because I just make that crap up in my head all the yeah. time. Um, so, um, but the only one where it wouldn't have been the same, I don't think, is Moneyball. Um, okay. Because, you know, I just kind of got it. The director, Bennett Miller, is only his second movie. His first one was Capote. Um, and here he is with a script that sort of reads like a documentary but it's got to be a movie and how do we do all this stuff and it's like we'll do it with voiceover things and you know when he's in the car the radio can be on when they're in the clubhouse the tv can be on and you know and so going through that and literally doing everything almost in that movie and then then hiring uh better actors than me to come in and replace uh what i had laid down and then you know so what you end up with is this cacophony of of different you know commentaries and sports guys and voices and and what have you and it and i think it really it really worked and 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 it stopped bennett from being this crazy like yeah, <laughs> to hey man this is the best project i've ever worked on you know because mm-hmm. it just kind of relieved the stress um but again, that was, you know, that's not a big, hey, 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 pat on the back. But as you know, if I were to try and say, which, it, what is the project that you ever worked on that you're most, you know, proud is the wrong word. It, literally, I just think that would not have been the same movie had I not been involved. Not saying that they couldn't have gotten somebody else and it been just as good in a different way, you know. Mm-hmm. But so oftentimes we don't get input like, like that you just go you do the job you're great at it oh man that was a great that was fantastic blah 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 and and it's it's a collaborative effort and all that everything is even moneyball is a collaborative effort but um but just being able to to hone it in to set up radio call-in shows with a baffle over here and i'm the call-in host and you've got all my buddies you know dennis singletary and other people on the other side i want pacheco uh, uh pretending to be you know, athletes calling in and asking questions. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's like we're a farm system for the New York Yankees. Next caller, you know, and just the fun of that, um, that process is, is really kind of needed. And it's, and it's very rare to like have more than a day on something. I was going to ask uh, too, if there's any story with working on the Annabelle or it movies. Oh, um, no, because again, those were just uh, different wall of things. So, you know, you're, you're, um, you know, it, it ends up being, you know, I'm the wet guy. So like if somebody gets their throat cut many times, it's me um, choking on their own blood and that kind of stuff. Um, 
So those were just those weren't uh, those weren't uh, anything unique or special jobs. It was just like, oh, those Annabelle things. Those 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 are pretty popular. I never seen it. Yeah, it's like so. It was kind of fun to to do that. It because it's a Stephen King thing. But again, there wasn't. Um, I'm trying to think if if Skip was on that with me. I don't because um, it's like you know we're, we're all of us work on so many things. You don't know what. You, um, but again, it would it would have been more of that, you know, making noises for the clown or whatever it would be, yeah. you know. Um, uh, and I can't. And I and the thing is too. Also, if you don't actually go and, and watch the finished version in the theater, or sometimes even if you do, they will very often, in fact, almost always have two or three of us do something. So like you go. Uh, uh, copy that we got a 10-4 and it's like copy that we got a 10-4 copy that we got a 10-4 you don't know which one they're going to use and it's like oh it's you know so sometimes we'll just joke and say hey if you if you know if you're in it uh we all owe you a quarter you know oh. we'll pay up, but we'll, we'll we'll do silly stuff like that and and um that is the other thing that's great about uh, the ADR side of the world, like, uh, you know, I'll get up there and be asked to do a newscast or whatever. And, you know, they go, uh, could we get an alternate voice, please? And it's, it's like, sure. Yeah. You know, go, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. Nobody takes anything personally. If the person with the money isn't hearing what they're saying, you know, mm -hmm. what they want in their head. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just kind of marvel that a lot of times they want some of the stuff that I do, like, um, I do, again to me it's cartoon voices uh like i do a lot of the um what how do you say it the period newscasters uh this afternoon president kennedy walked over and did this thing and to me that is a cartoon voice but mm -hmm. they love that sound for those 1960s sorts of things and then you kind of morph it into you know if it's a newsreel you know Today, the Hun, you know, did this and uh, walked over. They were, you know, you know, the Hindenburg crashed, and you know, and 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 when it ends up being like this, it sounds like it's a 1940s or 50s radio. Um, but again, to me, so those are fun. But it's like, really, you want me to do that? It's um, <laughs> uh, one of the one of the interesting things is because I'm the sports guy. Um, whenever I'm doing um. Uh, uh, an old baseball show, I sort of think of Red Baba, who taught Vin Scully everything he knows, and so foul back this way for a strike. It's 0-1. The wind is blowing out toward right here at Ebbets Field. Jackie Robinson on deck. And so I, I get asked to do that a lot if it's a period piece. But one of my funny tricks, I get asked to do horse races all the time. In fact, um, working with uh, Skip and George's Simon on a, on a TV show called Wildfire uh, that uh, went through like the mid 2000s um, for a number of seasons and was always doing horse races. So the Red Baba guy is, you know, and I really do. I really hold the nose when I'm doing him. And when it turns into a horse race, you just do it double time. And around the turn, they come secretary on the far side, followed by Susan with a Z skips ukulele and, you know, and do that. Yeah. So again, I laugh because to me that is a bad cartoon voice. But when they put it in the echo in the stadium, you know, and that's what it sounds like. And it's like, oh my gosh, that actually does sound like the real thing. Whereas in my own head, I go, holy crap, that was bad. You know. Mm -hmm. So there's there's lots of fun stuff like that and tricks of the trade. When um, when you speak when I speak of tricks of the trade, um one of the hardest thing to do things to do when you're making up sports play by play, whether it's basketball or what have you is who's on offense, who's on defense. And so one of my tricks is, you know, it's, it's always the in-laws against friends from high school or oh. <laughs> my sister's UCLA national championship basketball team against my uncle Bob's NBA championship, Rochester Royals team, you know, so you can, it's like you know who's who's guarding who because mm. you know and you can just keep the names the names straight that way but oh i'm giving away my secrets so do you have anything um that you're a part of upcoming that you can like safely talk about uh yeah i mean you know they the so much stuff is non-disclosure agreements now um i'm trying to think what did i 
What did I just let me let me let me look on the phone because I actually okay. did a few things just this week, but they they're like you know, um, so uh, it was Peacemaker I did on Wednesday a couple of episodes of that, um, which is uh, John Cena the the big the wrestler the, the, yeah. the Ultimate Fighter guy. So I guess he's a superhero or whatever. It looked like it was kind of fun. Um, Big Sky, I worked on on Monday. So that's a Montana small town, you know, yeah. murder mystery kind of, you know, cop thing. Um, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, the Nanny, uh, which is, 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 was a new thing last week. Let me just, this is just in the last couple of, and uh, something called Devotion on last two. So th that's just in the last two weeks. So I'm really, okay. I'm really lucky. It's, it's not like pre pandemic where you might work you know, you're where you're averaging three a week automatic. And then there's weeks where, you know, you work all five days and then don't work for two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. It's been remarkable to me that like one a week will show up and you're working from home like this. And, you know, and this is, this is my, my zoom call on, on those two, you know, where you go in the background. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, you know, I'm fortunate that I'm able to do that, but I would love um, to, do some anime from home since I'm here and I'm not doing anything else. What I, what I find myself doing on the days that I don't have a session session is I, I record a lot of audiobooks, And so that's what I've been doing. And also working on uh, a pet project of, um, I don't know if you know much about this behind me, my Maddie show, which sort of turned into a life project and sort of a calling. Um, I, I created an evening with Christy Mathewson, who was a famous, a baseball player for the New York Giants back in the early 1900s and um, and so I I just have so many pages of his writings that during the pandemic I've actually put a lot of that into four separate 500 page volumes um, and so now I you know I've recorded one and I'm recording another one and I'm, I, I what I want to do is just kind of have all that stuff available for like baseball geeks somewhere mm -hmm. down the road so that nobody has to do the research that I did um, for that show. By the way, I think um, it wasn't the greatest performance because I hadn't done it in a year and a half, but um, uh, a week and a half ago, I did the show at the Santa Monica Playhouse and they live streamed it. And I think it's still archived on YouTube. Um, so if anybody is curious at all about that project that I do, uh, I'm really proud of it. Not proud of that performance because I kind of stumbled, but you won't know the difference. Okay. Um, it was a small house the night that they archived. The next day it was a sellout and a totally different experience. So mm -hmm. you'll hear actors talk like this all the time. Oh, that wasn't a great show. Or, oh man, they're, they're dead out there. But I know that people are having the, the same great experience. Um, for me though, because, because I, you know, I, it, it was a little bit rusty it wasn't one that I, you know, it's just the only thing that's available out there. So I say, go watch it. You'll have an idea of what I, what I do. Um, mm -hmm. But I wish the next day had been the one that was archived because, you know, that's, that's the one that's fun. And you can see uh, Kerrigan Mahan's directing skills mm -hmm. on that. So, because uh, his, his hand is all over, all over my, my show, but find it. it's called Maddie. An evening with Christy Matheson and Santa Monica Playhouse. If you Google all that together, you'll probably find the link if there's any interest at all. Okay. So yeah, the my usual final question with interviews is asking what do you want your legacy to be? You know, um it's it that it's a good, it's an interesting question. You know, it's it's what's you, you know you use words like fun it's like that's not really it. what's interesting to me is and 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 just great and gratifying is that you even think i have a legacy um so what i just want to be um remembered as as just like i said you know from the very beginning um you know i, I want to be remembered as the guy who was great at what he did and worked all the time you know, that's, um, that's it. Somebody, you know, um, I, you know, it has nothing to do with anime, but I want to be known as a great dad, a wonderful brother, a super son, a terrific uncle, 
um, all that family stuff is really important to me too. Mm -hmm. So that means more to me than anything. And if, you know, it, um, there's, there's a line in all my Christy Matthewson stuff that ends up sort of being the, the main theme of the second act of my show. And it's really, it, it, and, it, and it's true. If you are able to touch just one life in a positive manner, you have succeeded in your own. And if you consider me a success, that means I touched your life. And that to me makes me feel warm and fuzzy. And mm -hmm. I'd love for that to be my legacy. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. I'm glad that we got to do this. Oh, me too. I mean, and I'm, again, I'm really sorry it took so long to, That's okay. to try to coordinate. Cause You're I'm actually my um, 94th, yeah, 94th interview. That's pretty cool. So you must have a really good archive of all of us. That That's that's neat too. That's kind of a legacy. And somebody will take that, whether it's you or whatever, it'd be kind of be fun uh, for like anime fans or whatever. So if you took and had like a, a one-page bio based on interviews for each of us with a couple of credits that i bet would be a good seller for you if, mm -hmm. if that was a project that would mean anything to you yeah I, I think it's a good idea it's a small market just like my the christy matthewson writings is a very small market i don't really care i just want it all out there you know so that you know from now to the end of time i'm connected to it um but that would be fun um, Thanks so much. And if you have any follow-ups follow or anything, you know, just feel free to ask and it'll take me about four months to get back to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'm going to leave the meeting now. It's great to meet you and thanks for doing it. Yeah, you too. Okay. Bye. Bye.